And Kirsten Banks, it's so wonderful that you've been able to join us. You've been teaching tonight, so you must be exhausted. A little tired, but I always have it in me to talk about space. All right, so let's give you a round of applause. Thank you. All right, I'm going to try something new today. And um, <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Hopefully it works. I tried it this morning. Okay. Can you see me on the slides? Yes, we can. Yay! This is the joy of OBS. This is a, not even OBS. It's with Zoom. Zoom's oh, doing right. this for me. It's fantastic. Okay. But uh, let's, let's roll with it. I'm virtually my own presentation. <laughs> I'm actually in space. All right. Well, hello, everyone. And thank you for tuning into Physics in the Cloud this evening. Uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I am presenting from, that is the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to the elders past and present, and they were the first astronomers of this land. Now, I'm an astrophysicist. My name's Kirsten Banks. You can find me on all the socials at Astro Kirsten. If you like short, fun, short attention span videos about space science, then you can check out my TikTok, because I think you might like it. But today, I'm going to talk about archaeology and seismology, just to shake things up a little bit. Now, when you think of archaeology, you probably picture scientists in khaki pants, hiking boots and hard hats, dusting away in the ground looking for ancient artifacts or even bones. And when you think of seismology, you probably think of earthquakes, which are a little difficult to personify uh, in, in an image. So instead, here's a picture of the San Andreas Fault. Now, both of these practices are more commonly understood as studies of the Earth in one way or another, but we can do them in space too. Now, I wonder what that might look like. Maybe something like this. <laughs> now, tonight I'm going to share with you how we can unveil the history of the Milky Way galaxy using galactic archaeology and the help of astro seismology. We're going to start with galactic archaeology. So instead of looking for fossils in the ground, we use the much older fossils in the sky, the stars. So stars are like living fossils. And if we can work out what stars are made of, how old they are, and the location of their birth, we can then piece together the puzzle of the history of the Milky Way galaxy at the time and place of the birth of these stars. So how do we work out what a star is made of? Now, photons. Or interestingly, rather, we want to look closely not at the light the star emits, but the light that the star doesn't emit. Herein lies the DNA code of the star. And funnily enough, during the conversation with Graham earlier, you kind of stole a little bit of my content, so I'm going to go over it again. But photons or particles of light are created within stars. And on their journey out of the star, they encounter many different atoms and elements. And if a particular element is within a star, then specific photons with precise wavelengths will be absorbed by those elements and less of those specific photons will actually escape the star and end up falling on our telescopes, resulting in these dark patches in a star's spectrum. This one in particular is the spectrum of our own star, the sun. Now, for example, there's a lot to decode in this, but stars are primarily made of hydrogen and hydrogen absorbs and technically emits, but for this purpose, they mostly absorb photons with four specific wavelengths within the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. One in the red of the end of the spectrum and three near the bluer end of the spectrum. So if we look back at the sun spectrum, this thick line in the red at the very top there in the circle is that red hydrogen line, which tells us that the sun has a lot of hydrogen in it which is good because yeah, that's what we expect. Stars are made of lots of hydrogen. Now, other elements are a little more complicated. Here we have the specific wavelengths absorbed by helium at the top, lithium in the middle, and beryllium down the bottom, for example, although I am blocking a little of the beryllium, but no one really cares about beryllium. It's the least favorite ilium. But we can use this fingerprint, we can use these elemental fingerprints to work out the chemical composition of stars. And we can also work out the age of stars by analyzing these dark spots, as well as their luminosity or the total amount of light that they emit and comparing that with models. But working out the precise location and position of stars can actually be quite difficult. 
There's a little space telescope called Gaia out there that does a pretty good job at determining quite accurate positions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, but it is rather limited beyond about 10,000 light years, which in terms of the galaxy isn't really that far, considering it's 100,000 light years across. 10,000 light years, pff, just a, what's the, what's the quote from uh, that book, that book that everyone knows, it's a short trip down the road to the peanuts or whatever. Oh, yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. Guide. What's that? The Hitchhiker's Guide. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that's the one. I feel like less of an astronomer now for forgetting that, but that's okay. <laughs> so we can use Gaia to find distances of stars pretty accurately to about 10,000 light years away. That's just peanuts to space. Yes, Lisa, that's the one, thank you. But another way we can determine accurate positions in the Milky Way is with the help of standard candles. These are astronomical objects with known brightness kind of like cosmic street lights. So all these street lights are the same, we're made of the same sort of bulbs, so they emit the same amount of light. But since ones that are further away, further down the street, they appear fainter than the ones closer. So this is the same sort of thing that we have with our cosmic street lights, standard candles in astronomy. And fun fact, standard candle is actually a term coined by the epic Henrietta Swan Levitt. She discovered a relationship between the luminosity, or the total light emitted by Cepheid variable stars, and the period at which they change in brightness. And with her discovery, she literally broadened our horizons from only a few hundred light years, because prior to her discovery, we could only, astronomers were only finding distances to stars using parallax, which is limited to a few hundred light years. But with her discovery of these Cepheid variable stars at the first standard candle, for astronomy, she brought in our horizons to almost 20 million light years away with that standard candle. So she is an epic woman in astronomy. But one particular standard candle that we like to use in galactic archaeology is a kind of evolved star called a red clump star. Now, why are they called red clump stars? Well, when we plot stars on a graph of surface gravity, what wrong way, surface gravity versus temperature, they group in a literal clump in the graph, in the red part of the temperature. So I know astronomers are really good at naming things. So the red clump is literally a red clump. So these stars are stars that have used up all of their hydrogen in their cores. So I've gone a bit too fast there. They've used up all the hydrogen in their cores and they're now fusing, fusing helium instead. So these are really effective standard candles because they all have extremely similar luminosities and we can determine their positions more accurately than Gaia well beyond 10,000 light years up to about 35,000 light years away, covering much more of the galaxy. But there is one catch. Red clump stars are very similar in color and temperature to another type of evolved star called a red giant branch star. They basically look exactly the same, but red giant branch stars are not standard candles. So this is a problem. We need to find a way to effectively distinguish these stars so that we can accurately map the galaxy with reliable red clump stars. And this is where astroseismology comes into the equation. Now, astroseismology is basically the study of earthquakes, but on stars, starquakes, if you will. But what can these starquakes tell us about stars and how can they help us distinguish a red clump star from a red giant branch star? To demonstrate this, I am going to need some beer. So let me just make myself a bit bigger in the middle of the screen here. And I've got my beer bottles with me right now. So here I have two seemingly identical beer bottles, much like our seemingly identical stars. When I blow into this one, it makes a sound with a specific pitch. But when I blow into the other one, it makes a sound with a different pitch. We have two seemingly identical beer bottles and two seemingly identical stars, but they create different pitches or oscillate at different frequencies. Why is that? Because of what's happening on the inside. The bottle with the higher pitch has more water in it, whereas the one with the lower pitch has less. They're oscillating at their natural frequency. Now, when it comes to these stars, they look almost identical on the outside, but their insides are also different. So red clump stars, they fuse helium in their cores, whereas the red giant brand stars have inert helium cores. Basically the core is made of helium and it's not going through any fusion. And these differences on the inside give rise to different oscillation patterns or starquakes, 
that we can observe with telescopes. And this allows us to effectively distinguish red clump stars from the red giant branch imposter stars, thus allowing us to accurately map much of the Milky Way galaxy and reveal its historical secrets. And with that, I am done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsten. Fabulous. My pleasure. Particularly because you managed to insert yourself into space. I know. I Somebody had so much fun says with that. you are a rock. <laughs> Somebody says you are a rock, so that's good for an astro seismologist. As as the son of a seismologist, I'm I'm surprised that he never told me that you could <laughs> you could do it in space. Lisa asks, what's the distance limit for doing astro seismology? She's even spelt it correctly, astero. Ooh. Yes, very good. You've got to keep that E in there because the aster is singular stars and astron is multiple stars, uh, which is why there's an, the E in astero seismology. There you go. It goes yeah. back to the Greek, right? It does. Perfect. Um, the, the distance limit for astro seismology, I will be honest, I don't know. As far um, as we can see stars, I would assume, because all we really need to know is the oscillations of those stars. But uh, so, these observations take a very long time, up to even four years, to get reliable data for these stars. Erin asks, what does a star quake look like? It depends on the type of quake. So it can quake radially, so it can kind of breathe in a way, or it can go squish, squish, but also can go squish, squish this way in like multiple different balloon. ways. Yeah, it's, it, there's a lot of different modes at which stars can oscillate. It's, uh, there's some really cool ways to, to see, well, to visualize how they oscillate, but they're, they're all very different depending on what's happening in these stars. And what you're actually measuring is the movement of the surface, Doppler effect of the surface. Yes. So what kind of speed differential are you seeing when it oscillates backwards and forwards? Oh, these things happen over the course of days. So we have to look at these stars and stare at these stars for a very long time, which is why right. it takes many years to get reliable data. Right. So it's not just like a jet going past. No, it's, it's going very slow. slow. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, uh, Aritra asks, he's been great representing India well. Lots of Excellent questions. These standard intensity stars, will they have the same intensity when they die? When they die? So it's red, the red clump is one particular phase of stellar evolution. So those stars don't stay there forever. They will evolve and move along to different parts of their life. And eventually these stars, at least the stars that I've been studying in my thesis, this is a bit of a, a window open into my thesis here tonight. Um, the ones that I study are less than three times the mass of the sun. So they will end up as a white dwarf star eventually. And then they won't have that standard identity. No, they won't. Right. Whereas if you talk about uh, supernovas, which are another kind of standard candle. Yes, the type 1A certain... supernova. Yep. Tell us about them. Well, actually, those are when white dwarf stars explode. Well, ah. well, depends on the white dwarf star. If you have a white dwarf star with a companion star, it can leach matter off of its companion. It's not a very good companion if it's stealing matter away. But then eventually when it reaches this mass limit, it explodes. So and it always explodes with the same just, brightness. After it's eaten the other star, it's so full that boom. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We've got three new messages. Look at that. Does our sun quake? It does. This is how astroseismology was birthed from helioseismology. So seismology of the sun. <laughs> how long is eventually, says Tim. <laughs> yeah, next question. <laughs> uh, okay. From the sublime to the superb, Poker asks, is it the same as the spherical shell harmonics? Yes. Oh, those are lots of words that I haven't encountered in a long time. Uh, I think so. I think so. I think that'd have to be, wouldn't they? We, look, we can Probably. approximate anything with a spherical harmonic, to be fair. Uh, um, so. With a series of spherical harmonics added up. So mm. you won't get each of the individual one, but you'll get like a Fourier series with spherical harmonics. Yes, yes. Thank you, Tony. And the, the other difference is if you're comparing atoms to stars, the star is throbbing, I think, and that's what we're measuring. Uh, an atom doesn't throb, 
uh, it has a different kind of oscillation around the surface of it, which is a, a different kind of spherical harmonic. So I don't think they're the same. Spherical shell harmonics, yeah, right, I see. Yeah, did I get that right, Kirsten? I think so. Uh, <laughs> I'm more on the archaeology side of things. Uh, my thesis is actually trying to find a spectroscopic link between the astroseismology and the spectra of these types of stars to make it more efficient. Okay. All right. So why is our sun not used as a standard? Because it's question. too close. We it's don't need it. It's just too close. Yeah. The, yeah nothing is, is, nothing is, is as bright as a star. how far, far away they are. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> Aritra has been following you for two years. So, been saving this question up for that long. Thank you, Kirsten. <laughs> Fabulous.